see my screen so far? You see that screen thumbs up? Okay. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so brief housekeeping. Um, you know, we'll be using a chat function mostly today. Um, this is being recorded. Folks can email me if you're dialing in. So if you don't have the chat function. And then um, the other thing is, uh, yes, recording. So it'll be recorded. And then the content, thanks um, everyone for submitting survey responses. I, I, we got a ton. And so some of the things were things like tips. We want tips and advice for my B Corp. Um, things like examples of diversity, equity, inclusion. Like what are companies actually doing? Because as you may notice, the new version of the book is pretty heavily focused um, on diversity, equity, inclusion. And I'll be talking a little bit about why that is and a little bit about my process getting there. Um, and uh, a, a few other things are partnering with the B Corp community, um, the challenges and benefits of certification. And so I got a good sense for what generally folks want, and then I'm going to be adaptive um, with the help of uh, Jessica Thomas from North Carolina State University. She's going to be helping me monitor the chat and also sort of respond in real time. So folks, feel free to add stuff in um, as, you, as you feel uh, desired. So. Let me just pull up, make sure my chat is working. So, <clears throat> so I'll talk uh, my story and then B Corp overview. We'll just level set with folks, make sure we're all on the same page. I don't want to spend too much time on generally what B Corps are because hopefully there's a, there is a book out on it, on the topic. Um, and uh, so we'll sort of get in, we'll just assume people generally know what they are. Um, but I will spend a little bit of time just level setting. Um, the majority of time will be spent more on taking some of these questions, you know, like what's new in the sec second edition, but also in dialogue with folks like Lynn Johnson from Spotlight Girls, um, Suzanne Siemens from Unipads, Jessica Thomas from North Carolina State University, and Jeff Ward from Anamiki. So we'll hopefully have <clears throat> answer some of these questions more in a, um, a dialogue which will perhaps be a little more engaging than just me sort of doing like an hour straight of talking about B Corps. Um, and then we'll end with some resources and next steps and then uh, have open Q&A. So feel free to drop stuff in the chat now and then we'll also have time at the end for open questions. So I, I wanted to start briefly um, talking about what uh, Oh, sorry. One of my uh, one of my one of my uh, attendees, Lynn, one of my speakers, it says it's, she's like, "What happened?" It says your event was canceled. I need to actually invite her to this meeting. So <laughs> this is what happens when a uh, there's a last minute uh, a last minute switch. So apologies, but this will be. She is a critical component to this uh, presentation. <laughs> So let me just see it, send her a quick note. Um, okay. Apologies. All right. So I think that I, I like to say that it's um, that my background is in criminal justice, so it's not in um, social and environmental business. And I think it's important, I like to say this at the start of talks because we often feel like in the sort of social or environmental business movement, you have to have some particular background. <clears throat> and so I, I, I started off in criminal justice and wanted to reform the prison system. And so I have no sort of technical, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not an MBA, I'm not a um, you know environmental science background, um, and and so one thing I like about the B Corp movement is that uh, you can have any any background and sort of get into it and start to create a positive impact on the world. So I've been pretty excited about that piece. Um, and the two books I read to get interested into the sort of green movement were Cradle to Cradle and Natural Capitalism. I imagine many of you have 
read those. They've been sort of part of the sort of basic requirements for um, for a lot of green MBA programs and a lot of environmental studies programs. And so I think that uh, that that sort of those two pieces really helped me initially. And then um, getting into the B Corp movement, I bet you Heather was at this event, the B Corp build. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Now my now my co-author Tiffany Jana has said that she is now available last minute, so that is exciting. So again, <laughs> I'm going to pause because this is another cool uh, uh, development. So apologies. <laughs> for the uh, sort of live, live action. Um, and so Tiffany, Zoom. We can have both co-authors on the book, um, on this present, on this webinar would be amazing. Okay, apologies. So, Let's get into the three reasons um, I'm really excited about B Corps that I think um, will help folks who are sort of thinking about why it would be a good idea to do it. So the first is just the holistic framework. Um, so some of the speakers will talk about this in a little bit, but the, the theory is just, it's the first assessment tool that really looks at every aspect of a business. So instead of just, you know, is your building green or is your, um, you know, is your milk organic? It looks at workers, community, environment, governance, and customers now is a newer section. And so for, I was really excited about B Corp because it was the first time that you could actually look at every aspect of a, of a business as opposed to just a part of it. Uh, another piece is the community. So Dano North America is the largest B Corp. Um, you know, pretty exciting to have them part of the community, Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's, you know, admittedly very US focused. So apologies for folks joining internationally. Um, but I, I think this is sort of showing why I was particularly excited to get into the movement was just looking at these brands and saying, wow, the, the companies that I buy from are already part of the movement. And so got very excited about that. <clears throat> and this is a nod to the international piece so when I worked, wrote the first edition of the book, there was almost a thousand B Corps, uh, but now there are uh, 2,800, roughly 2,800 in over 60 countries. So um, you know, Jessica and some of the other folks can speak to the uh, amazing collaboration and um, the ability to sort of uh, you know, meet someone from, like I met someone from Mongolia and they were like, I'm a B Corp. I'm like, I'm a B Corp. Yeah. And you can like hug and like, it's just an amazing community. Um, and so I think that that is a piece that's maybe not like, you don't really say like, I'm a lead certified green building. Like, so am I. And like hug, like, does it really work the same way? Or maybe there's other certifications that do that, but I think there's a B Corps tend to hug a lot. Um, so there's a lot of love in the community. Um, and the last big piece that I was excited about was recognition. So you have, um, for example, uh, John Mackey, current CEO. He's still, he's still CEO of Whole Foods, right? I think he is. So one piece with Whole Foods is that Whole Foods itself is not a B Corp, but John Mackey very famously uh, criticized the B Corp movement in his book, um, uh, Not Natural Capitalism, Conscious Capitalism. Um, and several years ago in 2013, I think. But as Whole Foods was um, sort of losing uh, sales, he, he realized that as a publicly traded company, um, there was uh, investors, sort of takeover investors, who were interested in um, buying into the shares of Whole Foods and then forcing his company to get sold for maximum profit. And so what John... Matthew is saying here is that um, he wishes he had the sort of protections with the B Corp legal structure so that um, when a company that's founded with the original, the original social environmental mission will not get sort of hijacked um, when there are uh, 
uh, people, investors who want to come in and just sort of maximize profit. And so he was really saying like, this is a good, this is a good time to be, I wish I was a B Corp. Um, and similarly, Yvonne Schoenard from Patagonia says, uh, oh, I have to like let, sorry, I have to let someone in. <laughs> this is so funny. Um, okay. Yes, for some reason, it was not allowing some of the folks to get in. Well, hopefully folks are good now. Um, apologies for a little bit of technical. It's, it's, uh, it's hard doing presenting and managing uh, attendee flow. <laughs> I was hoping one of my business partners was possible. But um, yeah, so Yvonne says, uh, I hope that we'll look back and say B Corps were the start of the revolution. So. Uh, good endorsement from Yvonne Schoenard. So the two needs that just sort of level set for folks who are, you know, just a little bit unsure of exactly what B Corps are, the two needs that the B Corp movement was trying to solve were the first, that's the standards piece of sort of how do we actually tell a good company between just good marketing and then um, how do we protect the legal structure of a company so that, um, when um, there's potential investors who want to come in and maximize profits, you can still maintain your mission. And so that was the original idea behind the B Corp. Um, and this is <clears throat> sort of visualiz visualization of that stand standing apart. So you have an organic, uh, Energy Star, FSC, Green Building, Fair Trade. Those are all good product certifications. And this is really looking at what does a whole company look like? Um, what does it look like to, to look at every aspect of, of a business? There may actually be 35 states that have passed benefit corp legislation, but in the U.S. at least, um, there's 34, 35 states, including Delaware, California, New York, and also in, interestingly, in like South Carolina and Florida and Louisiana. So um, it's been a movement that is uh, bipartisan surprisingly, amongst uh, our bitterly divided world. And so that's been a big standout for, uh, for the B Corp movement so far. And this is a picture of Jessica reading the first edition of the B Corp. This was not staged. Someone was just walking through the woods, and it was just a great photo op of Jessica reading the, <laughs> um, reading the book. And so um, uh, I... I Wow, this is funny. It's like making me admit everyone to the new the meeting. Wow, interesting. Um, <clears throat> so th that was the first edition in 2010. And then this is the new edition. And so let me see, let me just do a quick check to see if my co-author is on the phone. I see Lynn. Hey, Lynn, I just said, oh my gosh, you're in a car, Tiffany. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> hey, I made it. <laughs> yes, you did. I'll be landing shortly and not, not moving in a car. Fair enough. Welcome. <clears throat> um, so yes, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, Jana, and Lynn Johnson from Spotlight Girls. And let's see if Suzanne is on the phone. Just checking in on my speakers. Let's see. Yes, I see Suzanne's there. Okay, I'll just, I'm like unmute you preemptively, Suzanne, as well. Sorry. No, you're good. Okay. So, um, the last few slides here, um, and before we go to some, some conversation with, uh, with Lynn and then to Suzanne. So there's, I wanted to sort of pose something for you all. Um, this is me and Tiffany. Um, so what's changed in the new edition? <clears throat> so centering equity, which we're going to talk about a lot more, um, international growth, like there's a lot more B Corps now, private equity, there's now $2 billion that have been invested in B Corps globally. So someone had asked, a few folks had asked about does B Corp help with investment? Um, and you know, we can talk about that more as well a little later, but um, I think there's been some nuance in that it's not like if you're a certified B Corp, you're definitely gonna get 
tons of people wanting to invest. But I think it is safe to say that if you're a, a business that is appealing to investors, being a certified B Corp will not, or a benefit corporation will not necessarily turn them away. So I think there's been maybe a nuance of like, in the past, we used to say being a B Corp will like definitely get you investors. And I think it's more safe to say that it's like, it won't necessarily turn investors away. Um, so that's, this is like distinction. I think it's important. Multinationals, you have Danone, um, Unilever says they want to be a B Corp as well. Uh, Laureate Education is a publicly traded um, benefit corporation. That's the first time that's ever happened. Um, and a lot of folks said it'll never happen. And so that having happened is pretty amazing. Benefit Corps, there's actually way more benefit corporations in the, in the United States. I think there's like double or triple. Um, I th that last number I heard was 5,000. You know, there's only a roughly a thousand or less B Corps in the United, certified B Corps in the United States. There's 2,800 globally, but I think there's like 5,000 benefit corporations in the United States. So it shows that something has been interesting to entrepreneurs to really say, what if we could um, integrate this uh, legal piece into the, uh, into our company. Academia, which is uh, what Jessica Thomas will be speaking about. Um, and then um, impact management is the idea that, uh, you know, for example, you don't have to be a certified B Corp to use the B Corp tools. So Colum um, this Banco Colombia is offering the B Impact Assessment or you're offering or requiring, I'm not sure if it's so much as an offer, but there, I think they're having many of their um, uh, folks who are, who are going to be uh, suppliers to their company actually take the, take the assessment. And so that's been a big piece as well. Um, best for campaigns, that's um, you know, like best for NYC was I think the first one. That's where you have um, sort of a, a promotion. You partner with the, like the local government. And um, so best for NYC was part partnering with the Economic Development Council of New York and asking businesses who are not necessarily going to be certified B Corps, but just sort of businesses to take the assessment. And so it's really helping companies um, start to identify what are some ways that we can be better without necessarily becoming a certified B corporation. And then the last thing, inclusive economy challenge is a, is a piece in the B Corp movement around choosing three uh, or so um, uh, sort of improvements folks can make out of um, about 20 different choices around things like living wage, um, you know, women and people of color in leadership and management, um, things like, you know, paid time off. And so it's been a really interesting um, uh, sort of part of the B Corp movement to now have such a heavy focus on inclusion, which has been exciting for, all, for a lot of us. So the thing that I wanted to pose to you all was, um, you know, for, uh, for, uh, for some of you, you've read, have you, well, maybe it's a question, but I know many of you can't answer. Many, I think many folks have heard of the book, Winners Take All, and uh, by Anand Giridharadas and Decolonizing Wealth. And so I'd be, I'd be curious to hear what any of the speakers, and um, Tiffany can chime in as well. But you know, there's been a debate in the B Corp movement and the social entrepreneurship movement generally around, you know, are we really making a difference or are we um, sort of diluting ourselves and we're actually reinforcing old, old systems of oppression or creating wealth inequality? Um, you know, like an example might be uh, like the, like, you know, one sort of example that uh, Anand likes to use is, is Facebook. You know, Facebook likes to say, we're, uh, you know, we're doing good. We're connecting 2.2 billion people around the world. Um, and uh, the, the counter argument would be, well, you also, you know, badly managed a, um, uh, a potentially swung an election in the United States. And, um, you know, you're using that data, that customer data potentially for just, you know, making money. And so Anand in the Winners Take All books talks about B corporations actually, and, and poses the question, which I think is a good one, 
uh, you know, our B Corps really making a difference. And so I'd love to, if, if you know, folks want to put in the chat or if the speakers at all would like to engage in that. I don't think it's like a, um, you know, I think it's important to have that discussion because there are things in our world where, you know, Donald Trump's our president in the United States, for one. Um, so some alarm bells, <laughs> some, some alarm bells are going off to how that could happen. Uh, and um, I think it's important for us in the social impact B Corp movement space to really think about, are we, um, are we really making the change that we want to see in the world and making the hard choices? Because I think sometimes it can be like, yeah, we're, we're such a good, uh, you know, we're such a good social, social uh, enterprise and we give back and, and, you know, it might make you feel like that's enough. And so I guess that I'm interested in that conversation of whether it is actually enough. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and the other piece I'll, I'll throw out there is the Dismantle Collective is a group that I helped co-found uh, co uh, with Lynn Johnson, who's on this call. Tiffany was in the original sort of mix on that one. Um, <clears throat> and basically this sort of dovetails with the last question around are we really making a difference? And so, um, and hopefully Lynn and I can speak to this in sort of the next section when she speaks, but you know, the B Corp community is really looking at um, uh, the inclusive economy challenge. And one thing that we've been curious about is, is the framing around inclusion, which is important, but there's words sometimes like inclusion or diversity, uh, which can be a little bit lightweight um, in terms of what is actually potentially causing a lot of the challenges in our world. And so we've, this Dismantle Collective is a group of uh, 11 of us, and we've been using, we've been actually exploring the term white supremacy, which I may sound very shocking to, you, to many folks, but it's not meant to be white supremacy in, the ter in, the, in terms of the neo-Nazis or the KKK, um, it's meant to be what are the, some of the systemic problems in our culture and our society that operate by default and that folks don't necessarily keep in mind on a conscious, uh, aren't, aren't really conscious of. And so there's, um, there's a lot we can get into there, but I just wanted to like plant that seed around um, you know, one of the things I hope to, to talk about during this call, and then also um, you can check us out, there's a dismantlecollective.org website, um, is to really like, are we really sort of making a difference and what sort of tough choices and, and discomfort, because I think for white folks like me, it's very uncomfortable um, to talk about something like white supremacy, obviously it's, much more uncomfortable for people of color. Uh, but I think it's important because sometimes we can sort of just avoid it and, uh, uh, you know, sort of be in, like, you know, I'm in the Bay Area. So it's like, yeah, we're all liberal and we all voted for Obama. But it's like, what is, there's also an incredible amount of wealth inequality here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's maybe one of the top places in the United States or the world. So um, clearly there is some stuff happening that's not consciously or perhaps intentionally uh, racist or uh, designed to create that. It's just there are systems in place that are creating that outcome. And so this group of us is really interested in examining those systems. So let me, um, Lynn, are you uh, there? Yep. Hey. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> a little white supremacy by before noon here on the West Coast. <laughs> sure. um, so yeah, I'm hoping when uh, you could speak about just Spotlight Girls um, mm -hmm. and you know what what it is and um, you know maybe why you became a B Corp just to like sort of because folks are very interested generally about you know why do companies do this and what value and then you know I'd love to maybe talk to you about like how we got into the sort of dismantle collective and what some of the things are we're focused on there so do you want to do like sort of a just an intro of 
uh, Spotlight Girls and why you became a B Corp? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I um, am Lynn Johnson, and my company, Spotlight Girls, are we exist to educate, inspire, and activate girls and women to take center stage. We're based in Oakland, California, and we've been a certified B Corp since 2017. Um, and we, I just always knew that I wanted to be a B Corp as soon as I had heard of what B Corps were. I came from, uh, it was a pretty easy transition for me because I came originally in my career from the nonprofit space and particularly nonprofit um, arts and education. And um, so was already uh, a do-gooder as it were in the world. Um, and knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I knew that I wanted to create, um, I wanted to get out of nonprofits and be in a position where I, especially as a woman of color and as an artist, um, wanted to um, start to build, you know, wanted to own something. I wanted to be part of ownership and part of um, uh, commerce in that way. And um, and our what we do at Spotlight Girls is we um, create programs and we help other um, artists and social entrepreneurs um, create programs uh, for girls to thrive um, because we know that girls are the leaders that we've all been waiting for. Um, so we uh, create our own programs. We've been running a, a camp called Go Girls in the Bay Area for the past 12 years. And we're kind of shifting into a consulting-based model where we're working with um, uh, with organizations and individuals all over, all over the country. Um, so, you know, at the heart of what we do is a social mission. Uh, and so it made the most sense for us to be um, in a position um, to be able to measure what we do, um, um, you know, in terms of impact. And B Corp made the most sense um, to that. And uh, I had the privilege of being um, Spotlight Girls. My business was the first recipient of the Force for Good Fund, which um, Ryan helped start. And which one of, one of the um, goals of that fund was to support women um, and folks of color entrepreneurs in becoming best for the world B Corps. Um, and so as part of, you know, being uh, an investee of that fund, um, I got to work with Ryan and, and get our certification. I'm really proud that our um, out the gate score was 118, which is nice and high. Um, and then the very next year, we did receive best for the world um, in governance and um, I think community. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know exactly, but I know we did receive Best of the World. Uh, we can look it up online if we wanted to. Um, and um, and so there, yeah, that's my B Corp introduction. Cool, thanks. And what do you think about this idea of like, are B Corps really making a difference? Like, how do you, how does that sit, sit with you? You know, how do you sort of balance that or what do you look to her for evidence or, or not? Yeah, well, um, Yes and no. Um, I think that my experience is that, you know, I've, I've, having been at B Corp for the last couple of years and working in the community, I feel like there's a lot of really exciting things happening um, in terms of, you know, folks. Um, I, think, I think that we're making a difference in that um, most businesses understand that they can't just do whatever they want to do um, without regards to uh, to their community to the environment like there's you know there's like slight shifts throughout the business community that I think uh, is a result of B Corps existing um, so that some of our larger corporations you know do have um, you know a, someone on staff, at least someone on staff who's looking at sustainability, someone on staff who's looking at um, equity and, you know, those kinds of things. So I like that on a, in a small way, 
you know, we are shifting the conversation about what it means to be a responsible business. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I feel like there's so much more that we can do. Um, I feel, I personally feel an urgency um, in our work. Um, you know, I'm just on a personal level, I'm a queer woman of color and, you know, like Ryan said earlier, we're, you know, Trump's our president and things are going downhill really fast. And there's a shit, there's like all these shifts happening. I mean, at the same time, there's, because of that, they're all the, we're seeing a shift in the universe, uh, not to get too spiritual on you this morning, but that's how I feel. And, um, and so there's an urgency to this shift. And I feel like those of us who say that we are, um, you know, wanting to, wanting to make a difference, you know, wanting to be a force for good in the world, um, we need to step up even more, I think. And so, uh, you know, Ryan mentioned the Dismantle Collective and, um, you know, that was, I um, co-founded that along with Ryan and our other colleagues. Um, as a result of actually being B Corps, you know, we all met and came together last year at the, uh, at the B Corp Champions Retreat in New Orleans, um, not even a year ago in September of 2018. And, um, you know, we're in a position where we're like, you know what, if we're going to create an inclusive economy that works for all people, especially here in the United States being um, US-based B Corps, it's, we're not doing our job if we're not recognizing that the economy that our businesses are based on are based in an economy of, um, of slavery, the legacy of slavery, of colonization. It's really based in, um, you know, so many of our businesses have benefited from uh, a system, from systematic white supremacy. And we need to be able to name that in order to disrupt that. Um, and so, um, I feel like without having that conversation, so when we, when we came together, we said, let's put a session on the, on the conference agenda at the last minute and we're, let's call it, let's talk about white supremacy. Uh, and 50 people showed up. I mean, that, which was like 10% of the conference participants, which is amazing. Um, you know, it was, we called it a family meeting because, you know, we're, we don't need to, we shouldn't need, we should be the choir that we're preaching to, those of us in the B Corp community, community um, because we care, like we care about um, doing things differently. And we need to know that we can't just, um, we can't just like go on as business as usual and have a, and have some feel good metrics on top of that. It has to be, we have to look at things fundamentally differently. And so I feel like when we're willing to step up and do that, then we can really make big changes. So, so there's great things that are happening and there could be even greater things that are happening if we're able to get a little bit uncomfortable. Dr. Tiffany Jonah, do you want to jump in? Any comments? Yeah, no, I, I agree that um, the time has never been better for the efforts that we're putting out there. I think that uh, the movement is growing. And as Lynn said, you know, the sh there's a shift in the universe. Uh, whether people want to acknowledge that or not, you can feel it in the tenor of the conversations that people are having. Um, there's a critical mass of discomfort. And we know that, you know, discomfort has the ability to shift mindsets and motivate behavior like nothing else. So I believe that there are a lot of people who are more ready for this conversation and more ready for action than ever before and what the b corp uh, community and the b corp values offer and what the b corp handbook offers is a you know kind of a, a guided process a community a step-by-step -step process and a philosophy for taking action that is at this point demonstrably and measurably meaningful um, so in terms of, you know, the difference that we are making and the difference that we can be making, it's, it's no different than, than greenwashing was, right? So you're going to have some people who are <clears throat> um, motivated a little bit differently who, um, you know, intent, intent and intention really does matter. So for the folks who have good intent, 
um, who are really trying to build community, who are trying to have an inclusive impact and really shift the, the focus of the economy. This, the B Corp sector and everything that we stand for really does have the power to, um, to shift things in a major way. And you know, what's currently on my heart at the moment is a, you know, the first piece of uh, contested legislation uh, in right here in Richmond, Virginia, where I live, one of the 12 founding B Corps that signed the original Declaration of Inter Interdependence. Um, uh, Michael Pirone of Impact Makers uh, was recently kind of pushed out of his B Corp. And the board of directors that he selected over time is now trying to dismantle the power of that B Corp. They wanna shift the model and make it just for profit, enrich themselves, pay themselves. They've never been a compensated board and they're doing all kinds of things that are going to potentially undermine this entire sector. So I lift that up for you guys because it's on my heart. Um, I'm planning on sending out some, you know, some information for folks to kind of follow. It. I believe that this legislation will go to the Supreme Court and we need to win this because it will be a huge victory for our sector. If we win this, then we can demonstrably prove that embedding social and environmental values into our organizations has staying power, sticking power, it has legs. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we need to, you know, to sort of prove the model, um, to make the action really matter. Uh, we need the support of, you know, our various legislative bodies of our communities of the world. So look out for that, because um, if we're able to maintain the integrity of the, um, the benefit corporation um, legal designation, uh, that will be a tremendous win for all of us. So I'm super excited that everybody came out to be part of this launch. I cannot believe that uh, that my good friend Ryan invited me to be uh, to be co-author and to, and to be part of this, but it's a really, really exciting time and I don't think the time could be any better for it. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, there's, there's some good questions, I think, um, Tiffany, that the two of us have uh, been struggling with because even on this webinar, like being transparent with the attendees, it's like, do I bring up something like racial justice or um, white supremacy or do I just let it go because it's super uncomfortable? You know, so I think that um, what I'm trying to do and I think uh, what um, I think is important for all of us, especially folks, um, who are privileged like me who don't have to think about this um i think it's important that we still we don't moderate our voices because it makes us more comfortable um uh because it's basically uh no the silence is not just being like just being like yay b corps are the best thing ever is like important but i think it's also like to be like and <laughs> here's all this work we have to do and not just pretend it's like sort of all positive, the world's unicorns and rainbows. Um, because yeah, we're, our president, Donald Trump, <laughs> the third time we've mentioned it on this call in the first 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> can I, um, can yeah. I say something about that, Ryan? And that's, you know, um, going back to my introduction, I talked about how, you know, I made a very specific choice to move from nonprofit to for to for profit to be to be an entrepreneur because of ownership, right? And that's what we're talking about, right? Like that's what the work is, is ownership, who owns things in this economy. And um, and so again, when you talk about being uncomfortable, it's like it's also really uncomfortable to have um, you know, been um, completely left out of ownership for generations to have been you know to have to have ownership uh stolen from people so like and and being uncomfortable about a conversation doesn't um doesn't equal <laughs> the, level, uh, the level of uncomfortability that comes from that and so and so when we're looking at our businesses we're looking at ownership i know that there's a lot of great conversations about cooperative economics and cooperative businesses and people are thinking about that in really powerful ways and thinking like that's something that's really going to lead our movement um and i've been involved with a couple different projects around that which is really exciting um and i'm interested in how the b corp community is looking at, at, at co-ops i know that ryan you're part of a co-op and what does that look like um and you know so it, we just can't keep we just 
and a lot of, I see a lot of B Corps that are replicating, you know, ownership happens with people who have, have white skin privilege or who have economic privilege and, you know, like they might treat their workers well, but you know, it's workers of color and um, it's still, it's still replicating some of the same systems. So it's like, if you think about, okay, who owns things in our economy um, and how do I step up and do my part to shift that? Um, that's when we're really going to start getting to the heart of it. Cause we can't change anything if we haven't changed ownership. Great point. Um, Tiffany, I'm curious, um, you know, there's folks here who are from outside the United States. Um, I'm curious how you would respond to maybe the, not that anyone's sort of making this argument, but like that, oh, that sounds like you Americans have some problems, <laughs> right? Um, which we do, we'll, we'll like gladly own those, um, but you know, how do you, like, is this sort of um, exclusion uh, and, like, the, the racial equity piece, and, like, how does it apply outside the U.S.? And, like, is it, how, how should yeah. folks think about that as well? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that goes back, that goes back to one of the points that Lynn just made about ownership. Um, while many of the countries around the world are, you know, are quick to absolve themselves of the guilt associated with transatlantic slavery in the Americas, um, that does not absolve them from, you know, the marginalization that is happening every day within their society. So the work that I do um, has covered now six continents. I haven't worked on Antarctica yet, I'm working on that. Um, but yeah, six continents. And what, what you find, no matter where you go, is that there are always people on the margins. And those people typically are not participating in the ownership of the economy, in the ownership of businesses. Um, it is often on the backs of the marginalized that wealth is being created within the context of the countries that are that are creating wealth and so um, the onus is on all of us the world over to create space for those who would be left out so i would point to your indigenous populations i would point to your migrant populations um, i would point to whatever it is that your society is creating stratification around you know class and wealth and access those are the places where you're going to find the need for greater inclusion. Um, and even before ownership, you know, who is, you know, who is suffering as a result of our economic gain? You know, who, who are the workers? Who, where are we putting our, our factories, our plants? You know, who's suffering the impact of environmental injustice? And so these are the things that we talk about in the book and we're very specific about um, sort of naming some of those impacts to marginalized communities. Um, but this is definitely not an American conversation. This is a global discussion. Well, thank you, um, Lynn and Tiffany. I, <clears throat> I'm uh, just conscious of uh, some, there's some questions that have been sort of piling up a little bit in the chat. And I'm wondering, um, Jessica, <laughs> if you've been able to, uh, do, do you have any sort of, you want to toss out to to us or do you want to uh like i'm not sure how you want to so yes i mean if you want to go maybe the easiest way is just to go kind of in chronological order just sure. to make sure we're capturing some of the questions as they've been coming up yeah and so i think this is connecting back to the earlier question about you know whether um uh, so just more in kind of introducing the B Corp movement, there was a question from Judy around, are there any examples of um, impact investing, investing equity funds that are B Corps? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe what are some of the challenges and successes associated with those? And so I don't know. I'm actually... Um, that comes up in the, in the book or if there are... Impact investing equity fund. I mean, there's... The Force for Good Fund, which we founded, um, which is a small million dollar fund that's fully deployed into 13 companies. Um, and it was around women and people of color. I know that there are um, some larger, you know, impact uh, VCs in the B Corp movements. But in terms of like a specific equity fund, I actually can't. If anyone else knows, you can throw it in the chat if you know of any names of well, any, but um, I know there are many e impact VC funds that are B Corp, so I'm not sure if there's an, a specific equity focus. So 
yeah, renewal funds. That's a great one, uh, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. uh, equity fund in Canada with over a hundred million. Yeah, and I guess Nia, Nia um, Impact. What is the, the Nia Impact Capital um, from Lynn uh, is a great example. They they do do publicly traded equities with a gender lens screening. So that's another one. Um, thanks for throwing that out. Yeah. I'll mention um, SJF Ventures, which is a VC fund here in North Carolina with a focus on uh, clean tech uh, investing. So also a B Corp. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah. What else do we got here in the chat? Just wanting to. What, let me see what. Uh, looks like Chuck's talking about <clears throat> Anand and Jayco and Gilbert. Yes, that's a good, there's a good article um, about the winners take all. Jayco and Gilbert, one of the co-founders of eLab, wrote a, a response to Anand. Um, I think it's in Forbes, but if you just type in like winners take all, Jayco and Gilbert in Google, that article should show up. Uh, looks like Fabian and, um, is asking about Different scene, white supremacy and unconscious bias. Um, they're pro like the expert on this would be Tiffany. Um, how do you want to you want to respond to that one? Yeah. yeah. So um, I like to preface uh, white supremacy with the word delusion. So I call it the delusion of white supremacy because words have power, and I'm not going to feed into any notion that actually validates that. Um, so the delusion of white supremacy is just, it's that fallacy of the hierarchy of human value that, um, you know, back when uh, black bodies were being, you know, stolen from and taken from Africa, and we were justifying the dawn of capitalism as we know it, um, we created this, this, our white people created a, a hierarchy of human value and basically said that as long as, um, you know, as long as so, some people were worth less than others, that we could justify this behavior. Um, and the problem is that it has permeated every single thing um, that we do, all of our systems, you know, the, the, the very image of what we conceive of as a leader is, you know, a white male over six feet tall. Um, so, you know, when we talk about professionalism and being professional, it is actually a placeholder for behaving more like a white man. It's everywhere. And that is, you know, that was built as an intentional construct. Like we actually had a whole uh, the eugenics movement was developed to um, to uh, pseudo scientifically justify that white people were superior in a number of different ways. Everything that you could conceive of, you know, data was invented to try to support that theory, and the theory is false. Unfortunately, it was one of the most successful marketing campaigns in the history of humanity, um, and we still have messaging all over our society and systems and structures that continue to support the lived reality of white people being advantaged and privileged in every conceivable system that we know. Unconscious bias is very different. Bias itself is just a, the, a tendency of the human brain to favor one thing over another. Unconscious bias is just the biases about which you are unaware. So an unconscious bias is going to be something um, that an individual has based on you know, information, bad information, good information, experiences that they've had over time, but you might treat people a little bit differently based on an unconscious bias because it, it could be about race and you could have internalized messages that, you know, certain people are scary or not safe or certain people are not capable of being leaders and that might cause you to act in a certain way. But the, the delusion of white supremacy is a much larger construct um, that operates systemically. Unconscious bias operates initially at the interpersonal level. And while people can have white supremacist, you know, you know, ways of thinking, um, when we talk about white supremacy uh, or the delusion of white supremacy, it does, um, it does refer more to, much more to the system and structures that continue to support disparate outcomes for different people based on race. So your unconscious bias is you know, something that you can personally tackle, um, something that you can become aware of and you can make different choices. Uh, but, uh, but addressing um, uh, the delusion of white supremacy is something that we have to take on at a global, national, local, systemic level, um, not just an interpersonal level. So the difference in my mind would be scale and impact. I just learned a lot. <laughs> I, I would have not answered that question correctly, so thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure if it's correct, but this is this is what I have gathered on the terrain and what I can put into a couple of minutes for you. Uh, we re we've literally written books on that. So yes, <laughs> uh, white fragility, yeah. and, right? Overcoming bias. If you want to, you know, look at your own uh, unconscious bias and find it. Erasing institutional bias looks at it at the systemic level, but white fragility is really fantastic for um, really understanding. Um, the conversation around race and racism and white supremacy and then white rage is to me white rage offers one of the a, a really good um, kind of look at how how the the construct of the white supremacy is baked into our systems. <clears throat> Great. Mm -hmm. I love how we're just having this discussion right now in a B Corp call. <laughs> so um, uh, let's, uh, Jessica, any other questions? I'm sorry, I'm trying to like scan and listen to, uh, to Tiffany uh, before we move to uh, Suzanne's presentation. I do want to sign off oh, though. Okay, I've got a, a 2 p.m. call. So thank you so much, everybody. Please like connect with us on social media. I want to hear everything that you think about the book. I want to respond. If you have questions, just holler, let me know. I'm, I'm there to engage with you. And thanks again. Okay, thanks, Tiffany. I have to sign off as well, um, and uh, I want to say that if you are on this call because you're still considering becoming a B Corp, I, I would I would recommend it. I do think that we have um, I do think that we have, like Tiffany was saying, that the power is here um, if we're willing to step up and be create courageous um, and. Um, and definitely, if you don't have this book yet, please get this book. Um, and uh, and also join us um, at the Dismantle Collective. We're having an um, an unconference in Oakland on June 14th and 15th. Um, so I'll learn about that as well. And Ryan, thank you so much for being my friend and colleague and having me on this call today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Tiffany. <laughs> So maybe, um, Jessica, if there's any questions, then we'll switch to Suzanne. I want to be. I think we've captured all of the questions. There's some great discussion happening um, and some fantastic comments around the power of collaboration in systemic change and, um, you know, the SDGs as an example of that. And I think there's just some great discussion happening. But as far as questions, I think we've captured all the questions. If we did miss anything, maybe folks can go ahead and maybe try to pose that question again so it doesn't get lost in the, uh, in the thread. Great. I'll just put the, the Tiffany, admin, or sorry, <clears throat> Linda mentioned the Dismantling White Supremacy Unconference. So put that in there. Um, hi, Suzanne. Hello. <laughs> sorry to, um, I guess to come to you a little late, I, I, th I think I promised you earlier speaking slot. But. No problem. I'm sorry okay. I missed Tiffany because uh, we had done a workshop at one of the champions retreats a few years ago. So I'm sorry I missed her, but we'll catch up again. Yeah. So would you like um, me to share my screen or do you want to share your screen? Um, let me give a try of sharing my screen and okay. um, tell me if it's working. Hang on. Oh. Let me... Uh, Make you a co-host. I think they should allow you to share. Uh, let's try again. Share desktop. Share. Okay. Can you see my screen yet? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna put it in view. Present. How's that look? It's coming. Looks Got good. it? Yes, thank you. Okay. Should I get started then? Yes, please. Right. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me, Ryan, and um, I'm really glad to participate in this webinar. Um, my name is Suzanne Siemens, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Lunapads. We're based in Vancouver, Canada, and I go by the pronouns she, her, and hers. And before I get into some specific stories and examples about what Lunapads has learned and done to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, I do want to start by acknowledging that I do come from a great degree of both economic and social privilege, and that informs my views. So I am a cisgender woman who is straight, and in stating that, I don't pretend then to be able to speak from the perspective of people who are gay, non-binary, or trans. But that said, as a feminist, I really care deeply about social inclusion and equity and equality, and the menstrual space, as you'll soon learn about that I will talk about, offers some pretty rich insights about the opportunities that we as business leaders have to educate ourselves and become activists and allies 
to help lead the change on this really important front. So with that, um, br just really briefly, Luna Pads is a company that specializes in cloth washable pads and period underwear. We make our products with sustainable textiles and um, they're reusable so they save money and divert millions of pads and tampons from going into landfills. Founded in 1993 by Madeline Shaw, we kind of gently consider ourselves the Patagonia of period products. And so when I learned about the B Corp movement seven years ago when, we were, when I was attending the Social Venture Network, um, I, I decided yes, we should become, at the time we were a founding Canadian B Corp, and it was really to formalize a lot of our existing long-standing policies and commitments to being a social justice and environmental benefit type of business. And so we wanted to join that movement and find a better way to continue to improve doing business for good. And so for me, um, for those of you who are considering becoming a B Corp, I think what I appreciate most is that calls like this, we're part of a community and we can share our stories and inspire each other to do better. And I really appreciate all the tools and um, resources that are available to us as B Corps to help us actually improve our score. And that helps us become better employers, become better in terms of our governance and how we run our business. Um, we've done some really interesting things around our supply chain, thanks to some tools to help us be better. So um, it's just really great community to be a part of. And I'm actually right now even ducking out of a conference that is all about the B Corps in Western Canada. And we're meeting all day to share stories and inspiration and best practices. So it's really great community to be a part of. And um, we are also very fortunate to be a best for the world um, B Corp. We've been best for the world for the past three years. And just we've done a number of things that just have helped us become better and, and um, the score is just a number and it's a huge source of pride, but it's a nice way to help us measure that we actually are making a difference. And so some of us have had that conversation earlier, like, are we having any impact? And I think if you can measure it, then there's, some, there's something tangible to, to work from. Speaking of pride, um, this is, uh, I went one too far. This is our team. So we may look like a bunch of happy West Coast sushi loving feminists just trying to earn a living and um, do better for the planet. But um, what I wanna talk about is actually the person behind the camera who's taking the photo. And that person, their name is Lisa. Um, Lisa's on our team, they are non-binary. And um, you know, Lisa's worked for us over 10 years and it wasn't until we did a trans, trans focus is the name of the company, we did a, a workshop with our team to really get into uh, gender issues that we learned that Lisa's pronouns are they and them. And it really highlighted for Madeline and I how we assume so many things running a, a business that we think is very progressive and feminist, but we really realized we needed to go deeper. And so Lisa began talking to Madeline and I about their concerns around how Lunapads has a very cis-normative approach to doing business and doing our marketing. And at the time, this was probably back in 2009, we kind of said, yeah, that's, that's true, and, but we do need to focus on our core customers and their women and girls and you know, the trans community is, is very small and we can't really afford to do that. And so we kind of rationalized ourselves out of doing anything very um, meaningful. And what we did do though is we said, well, you know, our idea of being diverse was making sure that our models reflect color, race, size, and, and so that was our definition of diversity and, and that was all good and well, um, but we could do more. And so Lisa, to their everlasting credit, didn't give up and instead patiently persisted in educating us and advocating for trans customers with whom they were regularly interacting. And so we realized it was really time to do something about it and Lisa took it upon themselves to um, update our website and include comments um, where they wrote a blog post about how Luna pads are for all genders, regardless if you consider yourself male or female. Um, and that blog post kind of really kicked things off for kind of putting our stake in the ground and saying we care about all genders and we are not necessarily going to say that our products are for women and girls, we're not even gonna use that language anymore. And so, you know, we're not just about fighting the patriarchy, um, which is exhausting in of itself, but we're fighting an inherent bias against cis-normative approaches to our bodies. And so with that, um, we did 
decide to engage a company based in Vancouver called Transfocus. And um, at the time of doing so, we, we thought, well, what can we do internally to think about how we can do better and look at our personal biases, as Tiffany talks about? Um, and then once we kind of looked inward at our own personal biases and addressed them, we discussed ways that we could look outwards and say, how can we do better as a business? And how can we promote trans inclusion, for example? So we got rid of gendered language on our website, and we just brainstormed ideas of what we could do uh, from a marketing perspective. And so this is a picture of Levi. Um, Levi is a friend of ours, and Levi was born female. And during their teen years, Levi realized that they really identified as male. And he began a journey of transitioning to become a man and taking testosterone injections. But during this time, he was still menstruating, and he was generous enough to be willing to become our first transgendered model. And Levi is modeling our very first um, product that is specifically gender inclusive, and it's a pair of boxer briefs, which are used um, during your period so that you feel comfortable while bleeding and also just feel affirmed in your gender because the underwear that we make have traditionally been very feminine styled in terms of their a bikini cut or a brief cut or even we had a thong cut for some time. And so this was a, um, a product that really took us out of our comfort zone, but as Lynn and others have talked about, it's, it's, it's getting out of your comfort zone and taking some risks. And I'm really happy to say that doing this product launch was a huge success. It was actually one of our best um, product launches we've done because the demand was there and it was a real vocal recognition that we, as I said earlier, care about all genders and want to help them feel affirmed regardless of um, you know, how they express themselves externally. They wanna feel comfortable inside. And another um, idea that came out of the workshop was not just looking at the who we hired as models, but who we hired behind the scenes. And so this is Inez, who is, um, he present, they present as male, but they identify as female. And so Inez is transgendered woman um, who does our makeup. Uh, this is Danny on the right, who is a, um, a queer um, photographer who um, has done many of our photo shoots. And so we made it a priority of ours to try and hire anyone who's trans, queer, or persons um, with disabilities as photographers, um, models, and makeup artists. And it's, it's not just a token thing to do. What we really do is we want to create that economic independence and have them participate in the economy, as we talked about earlier on this webinar, so that they can be um, seen to participate fully and equitably in our economy to create that just and inclusive economy and it gives them confidence. It gives them a chance to be seen and acknowledged as their true selves. And we help give them exposure to the business community and see them as, as valued professionals. Um, here are two more models. Uh, this is Sparkle. She's an indigenous woman from the Cree and Métis community. And to address our First Nations issues uh, that are prevalent in Canada and um, we have a lot of work to do around reconciliation. And this is Kristen, who is a radio broadcaster, and she became a paraplegic at age 14 from a ski accident, and she's an activist, and we um, really like to showcase all the great work that she's doing. So um, that's some of the examples of what we have done in the past few years, and I think to summarize, as I said earlier, being in the, in the menstruation category is, is a really interesting place to be that we have learned a lot from. Um, it's a chance to educate ourselves about the whole gender spectrum and that it's not binary at all and that not all menstruators are female identified. And we have to think about the language that we use. I mean, we even stop using the term feminine hygiene because that's gendered and we don't like the idea that having your period means you have to be sanitary and medicalized. And you know, think about the language that you use and the images and the people that you hire. And finally, you know, the reason why I wanted to be on this call, Ryan, and when you invited me is, I take every opportunity to take my position of privilege and, and use my voice because I have it to stand up and be advocates for inclusion of all communities because they don't have the microphone as often as we do. So that's why it's important to me. 
And I want to close by just showing you the email signature that I have on my emails. Um, that was another idea that came out of our workshop from the staff and team. They said, let's put our pronouns at the end of our emails because it's about normalizing that you know, people care about their pronouns. And in doing so, when we identify our pronouns, it helps those who have pronouns that you may not necessarily assume are the ones they prefer to feel comfortable sharing it and saying, well, you know, if you don't mind, I actually prefer the pronouns he or they or them, and it makes them feel seen and included, and that's really what we wanna do is help everyone feel included and participate equitably. So that is what we do at Lunapads. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, if folks have any questions, or <clears throat> Jessica, has anything come up so far for Suzanne? Not specifically for Suzanne. I think there are a couple of questions that have come up that you mentioned you'll address directly, but I don't see, yeah, anything. Yes. Suzanne, I think one thing that um, comes up for me is just how important it is to um, talk about this, even though it's sort of not, because I think for, I'll speak for myself, it's sometimes like, well, I don't know the right way to say something or do it, so I'll just like sort of not say anything or not engage. Um, and can you speak a little bit to that, like, like maybe your own learning process around pronouns and like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like sort of any advice you would give on like folks to continue to learn and use their platform to speak about issues? Like yeah. I I think the biggest learning I have had is a to listen and not um, defend your your position or your lack of knowledge and to educate yourself and not place the burden on those who are trying to share their perspective and say, well, okay, you tell me what to do or you tell me what I need to do. It's like, no, that's a lot of labor and emotional labor that they have to go forward with. And so do the homework yourself and learn and then listen carefully. And then ask people what they want it, you know, how do you want to be um, spoken to and, and, and inquire. And then, um, yeah, I, like I said, it, I, I take the opportunity when people ask me to speak, I'm like, can I talk about this? Because it is not that well known. It's not that well discussed. And um, the more people can learn about it, the more open they become afterwards. So I think it just comes down to being curious and educate yourself and then be advocates. And I'll second the, um, don't just ask people for, what should I do then? That's like, it's, it's such a very lazy way to, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Um, well, there were a few questions that came up, um, not necessarily related to the, to this. Is it okay, Suzanne, if I answer some of the? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so Judy had asked, um, other than the Virginia case that was discussed earlier, what other legal considerations are there for establishing and running a B Corp, particularly in the investment financial sector? Um, legal considerations, um, I mean, there's a great, there's a great book um, that on this whole topic, uh, the, I think it's um, Benefit Corporation Law and Governance, it's by Rick Alexander. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to send out a, an email follow-up to everyone to, its, um, uh, to sort of has all these links, but um, the, the sort of that, that book basically goes into all the legal details you could ever desire. Um, I think the legal considerations are um, just ensuring that you're um, aligned with the people you're founding the company with. And then also, um, you know, once you decide to become a benefit corporation legally, uh, you do have a sort of understanding what that means in terms of your ability to, to take on capital and sort of um, to say no to investors who would want to sort of remove the social and environmental aspects of it. So, um, I mean, there is a publicly traded benefit corporation, Laureate Education in the United States. There's several others around the world. There's Natura in Brazil. Um, Silver Chef in Australia. Um, that I'm, I know I'm forgetting other ones. There's probably a few in Europe that I'm forgetting. But so there, if you can imagine that the lawyers for Laureate Education probably did so much research about like what could possibly go wrong, and they still agreed that it was fine to be a publicly traded benefit corporation. 
that I think it's um, uh, safe to say that it's a, it's starting to be more, more proven out in the sort of real world. So I think investors and other folks are getting more comfortable with the benefit court model. Um, and then um, Erica had asked about uh, impact. Any, any companies that include DEI in their impact reports? And Suzanne, do you guys do an annual impact report or? Not a formal one that we issue publicly. Um, we have been doing every other year impact reports on our global donations and how we've supported women and girls in the global south with uh, period products. Um, but other than the B Corp certification and that um, Global South Impact Report, not as much, but we should. Cool. So maybe crowdsourcing, if other folks, Anamiki, um, uh, B Corp based in Canada, Jeff Ward will hopefully be joining the call. Um, he's, uh, he was meeting with investors. They're raising a lot of money right now. And so um, hopefully they'll be able to join, but they can speak about their impact report. Um, <clears throat> Well, I think um, in order to keep uh, sort of moving along, uh, maybe I'll pass it to Jessica. Do you wanna take um, some time? And thank you so much, Suzanne. Really loved your presentation. And Suzanne and the story that she just talked about is actually in the B Corp Handbook. So if you have the book, just look up Luna Pads or Suzanne um, and you'll find the story. Thank you. So Jessica's going to talk a little bit about the academics and um, what she's been leading in the sort of academia. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Ryan, for the invitation to join this conversation. I have to take a minute just to say that being a part of this conversation, hearing you know, Suzanne's story, Lynn's story, you know, hearing from Tiffany and from you is just such a great reminder for me about why I as an academic have been studying and teaching about the B Corp movement for almost 10 years now. Um, I'm hoping to share with, you know, share on this call um, as, you know, as we're thinking about the handbook as a resource, um, making sure that folks in the B Corp and the Be Like a, a B Corp movement are aware of, I think, just um, the incredibly dynamic and engaged academic community um, that's growing quickly, um, you know, studying and, and teaching about B Corps and benefit corporations. And so um, just want to share a few, just kind of connect everybody with that community, share a few examples of how academics are um, engaging in this movement um, and share some, some resources. Um, and so, um, just a, a little bit of my background, I'm on the faculty in the Poole College of Management at North Carolina State University. Um, and I'm actually one of the founders of the global B Corp academic community. And we call ourselves B Academics for short. Um, there are actually two um, growing global networks. So B Academics is also Academia B. Um, which is a network of academics in Latin America as well as around the world. Um, and I'm really excited to say that just in the last few days, we've been building our, our network over the last several years. We've now got um, over 1,500 um, educators and researchers in over 50 countries around the world who are bringing B Corps into their classroom, identifying opportunities for collaborative research, um, studying B Corps and the, the broader kind of force for good movement and working with B Corps and uh, aspiring B Corps, engaging uh, with, uh, with B Corps um, to help them uh, make progress on the, the assessment and embed social environmental uh, impact into their business model. And, and I'm one of, I think, this really incredibly engaged and dynamic a uh, group of academics who are really passionate about teaching our students who we think of as future, um, you know, future customers, future employees, future investors, certainly, you know, current community members, future business leaders, and really, you know, preparing that next generation um, of, um, you know, of, of stakeholders um, to really help accelerate this transformation that we've been talking about um, and really building a more purpose-driven economy. Um, and so I'll just share a few uh, examples 
of how the, the B academic community is engaging with the B Corp movement. Um, probably, um, there's a lot of, you know, if you're interested um, in hearing about some of the research um, and some of the teaching that's happening in the space, definitely encourage folks to take a look at the beacademics.org website. Um, what I'll spend um, time talking about today is some of the more kind of applied um, uh, experiential learning engagement work um, that academics are doing. Um, and this is really under the umbrella of, I don't know how many are familiar with this idea of B-Impact Teams, which is a model that B-Lab developed um, to create uh, teams of students um, working with uh, companies in their community to help them accelerate their progress um, on embedding impact into their business model. And so this ranges from you know, companies like what Ryan mentioned earlier, who are focused on impact measurement, maybe not necessarily focused on certification, but on using the assessment as a roadmap to help strengthen their impact business models. Also with companies that are focused on certification, where certification is the goal, as well as working with certified B Corps on recertification, on the inclusive economy challenge, on you know, becoming best for the world, but really across that spectrum um, of thinking about really the B Corp framework and the B Corp movement as an opportunity for continuous improvement around uh, social and environmental impact. And so um, there are a number of examples in here across the left, you'll just see a few examples of really some of the leading academic institutions that are building different models of B Impact teams. And I'll mention in a minute, um, the, the, the team, the, the version that we're building at NC State, but there are student-led B Impact teams, um, like at Portland State University, their B Impact teams are part of courses, um, like at St. Joseph's University. Um, and I'll mention just uh, briefly our B Impact team at NC State University um, called the B Corp Clinic. Um, we have, a, I think, a somewhat unique model in that we bring together interdisciplinary students from a number of different academic institutions across the North Carolina Triangle region. So we've got, um, you know, for example, engineering students from NC State University working collaboratively on team, you know, and, um, with you know students from the Nicholas School of the Environment from Duke University, um, working with you know business school students from North Carolina Central University, one of our local HBCUs, working with students from Wake Tech, um, one of our local community colleges, and so working collaboratively across universities. Yes, even during basketball season, we make this model work. Um, but you know, working across disciplines, working across academic institutions with um, everything from startup ventures to um, multinational companies like Red Hat, um, and you know, working kind of across that impact spectrum that I mentioned. And so we've actually helped um, we worked with 15 companies that have certified or recertified. We've worked with over 40 companies over the last uh, four years um, on eight different semester-long projects. And we've helped companies make over 1,800 uh, points of improvement on the, the B Impact assessment uh, and, and leveraged thousands of hours of student time um, and coaching time. And so here's just kind of one example of a B, what a B Impact team looks like. And that is my son is who's just son? arrived home from school who decided not to come through the garage for some reason, but I will, I will get that in a second. Um, I'll mention really quickly, um, you know, more talking about how we are engaging and bringing B Corps into the classroom as we had the chance um, to work with Ryan and with Tiffany with the launch of the second um, uh, edition of the B Corp Handbook uh, to develop an online uh, instructor's guide um, that we've designed as a resource for other, edu uh, other educators to think about how to bring the handbook and how to bring B Corps into the classroom across uh, disciplines. And so um, if, if there are any educators on the call or anybody who's interested in just thinking about how this can be, uh, how the handbook can be a teaching resource in the classroom, encourage folks to take a look at, um, at this guide. Um, and then I'll just um, wrap up by mentioning that um, Ryan and I will be hosting another webinar on July 11th um, that is really focused on um, really expanding on this conversation 
and talking more about how, um, how educators are bringing the handbook, how educators are bringing B Corps into the classroom, and how um, I think we have estimated that collectively as part of this global B Corp community, um, we think we're reaching close to a million students every year. Um, and we hope that um, you know, we can really be a part of this broader B economy, this broader movement of really transforming uh, how business operates in a way um, that benefits stakeholders um, much more equitably. Um, so just a quick snapshot, we'll go into a lot more detail about what I covered at a really um, high level um, in this, uh, this next webinar on uh, July 11th, but um, definitely encourage folks to reach out to me. Um, my contact information is on our website and more information about our clinic um, here on this page. But um, if there's any way I can be a resource and just want folks to, to know that there are, you know, over a thousand of us out there who are really excited to um, learn from the B Corp community, connect with the B Corp community, support the B Corp community, bring you into our classrooms um, and, and really help um, accelerate this movement. Thank you, Jessica. And there yeah. was a quick question about, um, are there any, like, where can people find where there are B Corp teams that like, exist at their university? Is there a way uh, to do that? Such, such a great question. So we're not there yet. Um, the, the best way right now is probably to reach out to me. Um, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have a formal listing, a formal network um, in place yet, but that's one of the things that we're working on in the, in the, the, the B academic network is um, trying to map those 1500 academics so folks can reach out academics in their community um, who are working in this area but also trying to map um, trying to map research that's happening and trying to map the impact team so that's something that we really want to make sure is available and accessible we don't have that yet um, so I definitely encourage folks to reach out to me and I can help put you in contact with a local academic or if there is a local B Impact team. I'll mention our model for the B Corp clinic is entirely virtual. So we have worked with companies all over the world as far away as Sydney, Australia. Um, and for us, part of building a virtual platform means that we can work with students anywhere in the state of North Carolina. So we have students from Appalachian State University, three hours away, who participated in our semester-long clinic, but who've never met their team members in person. And we wanted to build a program that was as accessible as we could make it, um, and that didn't require students to, to have access um, to, uh, to transportation, to be able to uh, necessarily meet in person, and also wanted to build a program Program that we think um, much more closely mirrors you know the work environment where folks are connecting across geographic areas you know on video conference calls and on conference calls and collaborating um, using online tools and so to help prepare our students to work in that kind of work environment and to make the program more accessible so we work with companies all over the world through our clinic awesome um great so. so maybe um if there's any other questions for jessica feel free to throw them in the chat <clears throat> and uh jeff from anamiki has joined are you there i may have to unmute you or maybe you can unmute yourself hello oh you can unmute yourself he does own a tech company so Unmuting is not. <laughs> so, um, and then Jessica, I think you uh, would unshare your screen. Yes, let me. So I'm trying to figure out how to unshare it. Give me a second. Stop okay. share. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So, Jeff, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the first, there's some questions that folks had around um, sort of the mechanics of E Corp and like benefits, um, uh, challenges. Um, and I'm wondering first if you could just introduce yourself and Anna Miki. You guys have been at B Corp for many years, right? Four, five? Uh, yeah, three, three years. Three? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what is, 
uh, Anamiki and like sort of what kind of work do you do? And then we can maybe go into some of the pieces around B Corp. Sure. Um, bonjour, Anamiki Kwezans and Dishnikas. Uh, my name is Jeff Ward. Uh, and uh, I'm from uh, Canada. I'm originally from Manitoba. I'm Ojibwe and Métis, uh, which is uh, indigenous groups here in Canada. And I currently live on uh, Vancouver Island, um, island in the Pacific. So um, just a stone's throw across the water from, uh, from Seattle. And so uh, I uh, started this uh, indigenous technology company uh, in 2003 and uh, for many of those years I uh, was a freelancer solopreneur kind of person uh, for about 12 years and in the last five years um, decided to grow uh, our uh, digital services agency so all of the work that we do is uh, focused uh, within the indigenous community so um, I'm a uh, of uh, mixed ancestry. Um, my father's side is, is Ojibwe uh, and Métis, and I grew up uh, very much in the indigen indigenous community. And on my mother's side um, is uh, English and, and Ukrainian. So um, growing up in Canada and uh, really wanting to make an impact um, with my skill set as a software developer and, and web, web developer um, within the indigenous community after uh, you know, coming uh, back, uh, working in Silicon Valley for a number of years, um, 2003, after the dot-com uh, boom and bust, wanted to make an impact with my skill set within the indigenous community that raised me. So the clients that we work with are all indigenous focus, some way, shape, or form, um, make uh, uh, more equitable outcomes for indigenous people. So we support a lot of nonprofit indigenous organizations across Canada and uh, now into the US, um, as well as uh, indigenous entrepreneurs, um, uh, indigenous gov governments. I'm, our head office here is on Songhees First Nation, which is a uh, indigenous government uh, here in Canada. And what we do at Anemiki is we build websites, software, apps, and we are currently um, beginning to develop an indigenous data sovereignty product. Excellent. Um, and Jeff, when you were in the process of becoming a B Corp, was there any particular challenges or, um, you know, like what was the process like? And could you, is there any sort of like tips or advice you could give to folks who were sort of like in that sort of like trying to get past the, the hump or like kind of stuck uh, in a particular part of the assessment? like? Yeah, just trying to give folks some insight and advice from your experience. Yeah, it's a ton of work. Um, just to be honest, uh, I, I had spent uh, the most uh, uh, majority of my time over probably a month, month and a half, um, just trying to figure out and learn about how to do the certification um, to the point where now when I see that B Corp logo, I, I have some respect for the amount of work and time that went into that. <laughs> And now we're up for recertification, where we got to do it all over again. And I see that they've made some improvements. So um, to streamline some things and, and, and to uh, clarify others. So uh, I guess advice would be, um, you know, it's not a, uh, oh, just bang this out in, a, in an afternoon kind of thing. It's, it's like, you know, when, you, like when we uh, stated that as an indigenous focus organization, the populations that we we serve are, you know, mostly nonprofit and, and indigenous focus have a social focus. They made us prove that and back that up with numbers to the point where I had to go through and our accounting software and, and give like details of like down to the penny, basically. So it's a lot of work and give yourself uh, that that time uh, to do that and and don't rush through it because you basically can't. Yeah, that's good. That's I like that. You can't rush because <laughs> that will slow you down. Um, what about? Oh, yeah, go for it. Follow up. Um, however, the the folks um, there is like a follow up call uh, part of the process, and uh, I guess part of the advice, uh, you know, just submit your application because um, there are supports. They do go through your application, and in our case, found 
at least 10 more points that we uh, didn't see on our application, um, which, which helped a lot. So. And then um, what are the benefits or, you know, what have you seen as becoming a B Corp? Is it, you know, do your clients notice, do people care or is it like, your, does your team care? I'm kind of curious, like what, what yeah. your response you've seen? Well, in many ways, uh, we operated um, like a B Corp. I, I didn't know that we did. I didn't have the language to describe, um, you know, what I've been doing for the last, uh, at that point, 12 years. Uh, until one of my friends who had recently certified said, you know what, I think you, you operate already uh, like, like a B Corp. And I was like, oh, what's, what's B Corp kind of thing. Um, and so we, we got in um, uh, on the, the first try sort, sort of thing. So um, because of the, the systems and, and values approach that we already had. And I think um, my hunch is that many uh, organizations considering B Corp certification again, already, you know, meet, meet a lot of the levels. So, um, yeah, as I guess how it changed within our team, um, you know, the, the word uh, B Corp, you know, was new to our team. Um, you know, even words like slim impact and the language that the broader, um, I guess, impact community uh, uses, we never really used a lot of that language and just the work that we, that we did, we are just, and I find a lot of, uh, you know, social entrepreneurs and, and social focused organizations are just heads down, uh, getting their work done, doing good work and um, don't really have the time to look up, spend a month doing a B Corp application. <laughs> um, but uh, so I guess what it did for us is it gave the language to better describe what we have already been doing as a social enterprise and describe that to the broader impact community. Um, and it's, you know, been afforded me the, the privilege to connect with folks like uh, Ryan and like just the people that are here in this room, um, here on Zoom, you know, there, there's, uh, it does connect you to a community of like-minded people. Um, and for me, um, I got a chance to speak at the Be Inspired um, in uh, Toronto to, you know, in Massey Hall, a room full of, uh, uh, of like-minded people talking from an Indigenous perspective on social enterprise. So it's been a way to connect what many Indigenous entrepreneurs, uh, how they've already been operating businesses, and bring that to uh, the B Corp community. And I'm sure many people who are considering B Corp certification have a lot to uh, add uh, to the B Corp community. It's, um, yeah, there is, uh, like I, I think we're 10 years of B Corp certification. Um, and really it's just the beginning. And the people who are here in the beginning um, are going to be helping guide the direction of, of, of the community. And so, yeah. Yeah, one question, Jeff, is, you know, impact is, can be truly a like very Western viewpoint of like what impact is. Um, and I'm curious from like an indigenous maybe perspective, is there things that should be like included in a sort of better accounting of like impact or um, like what are we missing from in, in sort of like the incredible base of knowledge from indigenous communities that like what, what do you think sort of E corps or other social impact companies could learn that we're sort of missing out on. Yeah. Um, so, like, I think a lot of indigenous uh, entrepreneurs and just organizations, um, I guess, they have been operating social enterprises, but not using that term. Like Canada uh, was essentially built on a social enterprise between early settlers and indigenous people. There was a business relationship that was there um, and really it was a social enterprise, right? So, you know, uh, I think um, a lot of the practices um, that you see in, in B Corp certification and looking to indigenous communities and organizations, things around uh, governance, um, 
I guess, uh, environment, uh, equality, respect for women is baked into the fabric of indigenous cultures. Like we're in my community, we're a matriarchal society. So, um, you know, what I shared uh, at, at the Be Inspired event is like indigenous women in business are outperforming, outperforming men in business and um, indigenous men in business. So, uh, you know, I think it goes down to a value system that is deep within the fabric of, of indigenous cultures. And um, so, you know, what I, what I think the, the, um, the impact assessment and, and the B Corp community is missing um, is um, uh, some sort of uh, connection to the land where B Corps operate and respect for and collaboration with local indigenous communities because the indigenous knowledge that we have here, and I'm a visitor on the Lekwungen territories here on Vancouver Island, I'm from you know, Manitoba, the teachings of the land here are much different than what, where I grew up. Um, you know, so like we partner with and, re and, and you know, give back to the land here. And I, I you know, wherever we are, uh, not just uh, what we call Turtle Island, North America, but around the world, you know, there are indigenous knowledges there that I think need to um, be respected and, and connected with. Um, so if I had one request, and I actually have made this formal request, uh, and that, that would be for, um, you know, B Corps around the world to um, be connected with indigenous groups uh, local to them in productive ways. Yeah. Because um, I'm, I'm super interested in, in actually looking into that. Is there any sort of like any particular ways to be connected, just more of like learning. I mean, probably first step is like, whose land are we on, right? Yeah. Um, and then like, what does like an authentic engagement look like that isn't sort of like patronizing or sort of wait, wait, yeah. Yeah, so uh, land acknowledgements are um, becoming more and more common. Um, I'm not sure in the US or around the world, but it's common. Uh, you know, at the start of an event that we, you acknowledge the traditional territory of, and, and in many cases in Canada, it's actually unceded territory, right? I mean, that is uh, the bare minimum <laughs> that would need to happen, but of course there's um, actually considering local stakeholders um, in all the work that impacts uh, the land and, and the community. Um, we actually did a B Corp, uh, sorry, a B, with B Lab Canada, uh, a, web, a webinar um, on how businesses can engage in uh, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. So it is mostly focused within Canada, but um, it might be worth looking up. Um, you can find it on our uh, Animiki uh, blog, uh, it, or maybe if there's a follow-up, I, I can get that link uh, to you, Ryan, to, to send out um, to how uh, businesses can engage within the, the reconciliation movement uh, with indigenous peoples. Yeah, that's, I would be super interested. I'm sure others would. Um, someone had asked earlier about impact reporting and um, do, does Anna Mickey um, <clears throat> report on DEI uh, or what? Like, is there a DEI element in your social impact reports? Sorry, what's DEI? Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. So, okay. um, yeah, women, people of color, and uh, okay. yeah. And sorry, the question is? Is that part of your impact report, your social impact report? Um, we, as far as staff and employees go, we don't report that. Um, and uh, we're still in the process of releasing last year's impact report, but you can go to see our, our impact reports published on our website, nmiki.com. But um, we do, in our, in our supply chain, we do um, uh, have an importance on our Indigenous suppliers, uh, as well as uh, uh, women and Indigenous women. So we do report that. Um, on our team, uh, you know, we're 11 people. Um, the majority of our team are Indigenous. Um, and you know, I when I am out in the sort of mainstream tech community, I say that at Anemiki we are diversity in tech in action. Yes, Emb the embodiment, right? 
Um, is there anything else you want to share with folks around, um, like, cause some of the, the questions folks had were more generally about like the uh, sort of process and benefits and challenges of becoming a B Corp. I guess one question would be like, how do you partner and engage with the B Corp community? Like, do you have a specific way that you try to interact with other B Corps and sort of build community or coalitions or what advice can you give to folks around that? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, there's this wonderful event that happens each year. Um, you know, I've only been uh, lucky enough to, to go to uh, the one in Toronto, but of course there's, you know, the, the um, annual event. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, people in the B Corp community, they're, they're also very busy, right? They're very busy making an impact. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people are, are very heads down in, in, in their, their own world and, and don't always have the time to, to poke their head up and say, hey, who else is here doing, you know, um, good work. Um, but, you know, there's, from time to time, there are awesome webinars like this, Lyft, uh, Lyft Economy is a, is a fantastic resource, um, where if you, yeah, and, and others, of course, that um, help, would help you stay connected with, with the broader community. So, you know, even uh, connecting with people on, on the, the B Corp, uh, uh, the directory itself, right? You can find B Corps in the community near you. Um, so, like, I, what it's benefit for me is I've met now other B Corps in Vic, the Victoria, broader general uh, Victoria um, city where I'm living, where I've now met with, you know, five, five or eight, you know, local groups. And uh, we've met up uh, a couple times and seen in the community. So, you know, just using some of those resources to connect locally so that you can actually have a face to face and, and think, think through plan like a little local mastermind group or something like that, I'd recommend. Excellent. Um, I think uh, there's maybe one or two. Yeah, thanks for folks posting in the chat. Oh, thanks, you know, Michael. Michael found it. Excellent. Um, and we are, in the last 15 minutes or so, we're basically in open Q&A. Um, one question, uh, thanks Heather for, for posting that, she asked, uh, how can the handbook be used as a guide to move through the e impact assessment process? Um, th Heather's throwing me some softballs. Um, thanks for that. Um, so there is a quick start guide in the back of the B Corp handbook that um, is uh, really designed to um, be that sort of step-by-step -step guide for folks. There is, um, there is one other piece that I'll mention um, that can be useful. Um, let me see if I can find, I need to open uh, one quick document and find these up. Uh, basically, there's some quick, quick assessments. Um, let's see if I'll share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, let me make this a little bigger. In the B Corp handbook, there's these quick assessments. Um, it's not kind of lame, it's only showing one page. But <clears throat> one thing you can do if you're, say, in your own company and you're um, sort of having some, you know, having a debate maybe with internal stakeholders about whether we should become a B Corp or you're sort of stuck on B Corp. Um, and you want to sort of get to the next level. One thing I've done is taken these quick impact assessments. You can, and what I'll do is actually after this call, I'm going to send everyone um, like the PDF of the five different sections of the quick assessments. because so that's going to be way easier than sort of like copying them out of the book and then using them. So I'll just send that out to everyone afterwards. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah. Um, and what you can do is you just, you know, you meet with your team and say, hey, you know, let's, let's answer some of these questions together. Um, 
So for example, like, do we already monitor and record greenhouse gas emissions? Yes or no. And you sort of go through these and you put a check mark next to each one. Um, and then this is the second page. And at the end, you have a little total and you can add up how many points you got. And then it, you know, it says if you scored zero to three, you have some work to do. If you scored four to six, you're a good candidate for B Corp. If you scored seven to 12, fantastic work. You're, you're likely well on your way to becoming a B Corp. So um, this is a really simple way to um, get folks in your company engaged without necessarily having to like log into the assessment and like show them the whole, sometimes it's overwhelming for people to see the whole the impact assessment unless they're, they're nerds like me and a few other folks on this call. Um, so that's one really good exercise and I will, um, Heather, you can hold me responsible to actually sending out those quick assessments. So I, I will do it, I just need to make sure to nudge me. Um, and uh, let me see if there's um, any other ones, any other questions. Um, based on, oh, Kim is asking, um, based on attendance engagement, might you consider another possibly quarterly Zoom conference calls? Wow. I would consider it. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I think our attrition might slowly lead down to like five people, <laughs> but depending on how interesting the calls are, I'm definitely open to it. Um, so yeah, folks wanna have more of these calls. Maybe we could have one more, um, you know, maybe uh, in, the, in the fall or something like that, where it's sort of like giving us a little breather and like what's been happening and maybe there could be some community co-sharing. So I'm definitely open to it. So folks wanna send me an email um, and, uh, yeah, let's 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 collaborate more. Um, yeah, post conference. It's a good, good point, Erica. The, so the B Corp Champions Retreat is uh, September, I think, fourteenth. Yeah, like fifteenth. Yeah, seventeenth. Seventeenth. Okay. And eighteenth, I think. Okay. Yeah. So mid September. So maybe it's after the comp, the B Corp Champions Retreat. Um, let's see. Are there questions listed? in the quick assessment, the same as the assessment questions listed in the comprehensive. There, um, the sort of intention is behind is the same. Um, so in the book, the ones I just showed, there's things like, you know, measure greenhouse gas emissions. Some of them I combined to be a little bit short because like the B impact assessment has 150 or so questions on it. And so, one thing I didn't want to do with this, with the B Corp handbook was like recreate the B impact assessment in paper form because it's dynamic and it sort of adjusts to your tip, particular business type. Um, and so what um, the, the quick assessments can do and be useful for is sort of like getting people excited and engaged enough to be like, whoa, what's, let's actually move over to the full assessment and really do a deep dive. So I think that that's maybe the best way to think about the quick assessments. Um, and um, yeah, so let's see other questions. Encourage people, thank you, Heather, to, to give the book as a gift to help build the movement. Um, so if you need a, a good gift to give to people, um, B Corp Handbook is, is pretty good. Um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll show the, um, I'm going to show a few quick slides of resources for people in case they want to sort of, um, so lifteconomy.com slash book. Let me just make this a little bigger. Um, so that's where you can, you can get it. Uh, if folks are already sort of interested in B Corp, you just need to take the next step check out the impactassessment.net. It's free, um, uh, it's private, and it's a great way to sort of start moving towards using business as a force for good. Um, we have a podcast called Next Economy Now. If anyone is interested, we do weekly episodes. It's on iTunes and you know, Spotify and all the, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, so there's weekly interviews with a lot of B Corp leaders. Um, are on the podcast. 
Uh, some folks had asked me about like, how do I actually become a consultant to help companies become B Corps? So um, a, a year or two ago, Matt Mayer and I from Conscious Brands created the Secrets to, to B Corp Consulting course, the self-study course, um, self-directed. And there's a discount code if folks are interested. Um, I can, I'll send all this out afterwards. We just wanted to put in a brief plug there. Uh, and then, yeah, folks can email me, Lift Economy is the website. Um, and Suzanne and others, if you're open to it, I could send out contact information in case folks have follow up. Um, okay, and Jessica, you too, Jeff. And so, um, yeah, I think that's uh, it in terms of my formal presentation. But um, if folks have any other questions, you can throw it in the chat or. We can end a few minutes early even. We'll have lunch on the West Coast. <laughs> it <laughs> looks like there's one more question about um, courses focused on the certification process. Mm -hmm. And I just mentioned just from academic institutions, I'm not aware of any standalone courses, but I was wondering, I don't know if Lyft Economy or other companies like Lyft Economy, or there might be other kind of standalone courses that are, that kind of go into more depth about the, the certification process. Yeah, I guess that would be, Tiffany, uh, maybe a clarification is that <clears throat> like for people helping their own company and they just want assistance, or is it more for like, if you want to become a consultant? Mm -hmm. um, because there's, um, there's not really a, um, a formal certification for consultants. There's just, you know, most of the B Corp consultants that, you know, Heather and others that I know are just, we, we certify our own company as a B Corp and that sort of is like a, a proxy way of getting, um, you, you sort of have to know the process yourself where you can help other companies. And then um, B Lab does offer uh, several videos and like sort of, how to webinars of just like literally getting through certain parts of the uh, online assessment. So um, that could be a resource for folks. And maybe I'll put that in the chat, the, the link to those resources. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Um, this was really fun, and I'm glad you all uh, stuck around, <laughs> those of you remaining. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, uh, thanks to our presenters, Suzanne, Jessica, Jeff, Lynn, Tiffany was on. Um, and so uh, it's been a really great time, and I hope to see you all soon. So thank, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Ryan. I'll, I'll send out the recording <laughs> after this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.